history. And that is, that is really the power, because you can go on to, to tell so much more. You can talk, you know, nobody's ever really read War and Peace to understand uh, the Napoleonic troop movements. You read it to, to understand the cataclysmic uh, events and the effects on those characters' lives. No one's ever read Dr. Javaka to understand the socioeconomic implications of the Russian Revolution. You read it to understand what that, that dark, monstrous period did to people like Javaka and Laura. And by so doing, we learn something about ourselves. That's what Shakespeare was teaching us. In Richard III, you, you have lessons as to who you don't want to be. In other times, you have lessons in who you can be, who your higher angels might be. That, that, that's the whole point of historic fiction. And I, I thought maybe if I could tell a story, maybe people would know. When Kerry McGavick died in 1905, one of those who was there um, wrote, those who recall the hours as they begin days, as she ceased to care for herself, as she cared for the dying, those who recall the two feet of blood on her skirt and the blood up to her elbows, and as she cared for the dying, how she spent the remainder of her life caring over the dead. We in all generations will rise up and call her blessed. The truth is, we didn't even rise up and call her Carrie. Um, we, we, when I got on the board, then, hard to believe this, the youngest board member at Carnton, um, so many years ago, we called her Caroline. You know, why, why does her tomb say Carrie, but we say Caroline? Well, the executive director didn't like the name Carrie. And so it seemed that, that even her name was being robbed from her in some way. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell the story of this amazing moment in history and of how, how, it, how it impacted all these lives and would for, for years and years to come. And I was very, very fortunate that, you know, in our lives we, we so often uh, have goals and, and so few of them uh, really turn out even better than we ever dreamed. And yet I was so fortunate that, that, that <coughs> people got her story, that people understood, that people saw this, that, that people were willing to, to, to identify with her, and, and that they still do. We've, saw, we've seen heritage tourism in Franklin grow uh, many times since the book came out. As people come here to try to understand the story, to see what that cemetery is, you see, her story isn't really very different from the stories of women throughout the South and Pennsylvania in those four years. It, it's really not very different from the history of the world. Men usually go to war, and then women are left to, to heal, to pick up the pieces, to bury and mourn. That, that's really the story for the ages. What makes her story so unique is that what happens two years later, when she her husband and others went out to the, 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 the battlefield and literally dug up uh, these almost 1,500 boys and reburied them. And then she did something, uh, you know, kind of unique for us. She simply spent the remainder of her life remembering. Uh, she didn't write about herself. Uh, she didn't think that what she was or who she was or what she was done was that particularly remarkable. She simply remembered. And, and yet in that, I think that she represents, as one person said, when she died, the, the, the epitome of Christian piety, the truest sense of what she was doing. And so that was the story I wanted to write. I wanted to write a book about this battle, these, these, these five bloodiest of hours. And so I, I then went on this book tour. It was September uh, 2009. And there was this other thing that was happening at that time, you may remember Katrina, and I went on what was Warner Books' longest book tour. It was a 17 city pre-tour, um, 47 or 8 city hardback tour, and then a 10 city paperback tour that somehow became a 17 city paperback tour. And um, my publisher wanted me to go to New Orleans. Now I love New Orleans, in fact I had been in New Orleans literally 
uh, three days before my book came out, and I was in New Orleans, in other words, like three days before Katrina, and we were kind of trying to get out of town. My family's been involved with New Orleans and had a relationship with it since before the, the, before the Civil War. My uh, grandfather helped found, found it, uh, the Gulf Mobile and Ohio Railroad, and, and so eventually uh, built their headquarters in Mobile. And, uh, you know, we have a long, long-standing history with the city, even going back, as I said, to the 1850s. And yet, <laughs> my publisher decided they wanted me to go there because they wanted to show real support for the city and for the booksellers there. The irony was is that, that few people were buying books, very few people were buying groceries at this point. When I came in, the only way I can describe the city is that it was very different. It looked like uh, the descriptions I read of Phnom Penh after the Khmer Rouge. They were literally, and this is at, um, my, my words, but the New York Times described it as tens of thousands of automobiles. You know, if you and your, your uh, family were leaving New Orleans and you own two cars, and most people do at least, uh, and the roads were jammed, you, you, you all got in one car. And so all the cars that had been left were pretty much ruined. It was, uh, much of the city was just completely dark. I was taken to the uh, Monteleone Hotel that my family has stayed in for generations. It was a very different Monteleone Hotel. They, uh, they, they had moved the staff and their families into the hotel and they just put up food. And I was one of the very few paying guests. And as I walked those streets, I thought, I really would like my next book to be something about New Orleans. I would like it not to be just a, a place in the book, but to, to be a character. I would like to talk about this city, which at that time, you may remember, people were talking about it, it might not come back. And, and then talk about how incredible the city is. And also possibly try to find some parallels from then, wherever then was going to be, to now, that, that New Orleans can and does survive. The problem was, I was still very eaten up with the Battle of Franklin. I probably was a little bit. I, I, I find great uh, comfort in, in trying to understand that battle and what happened here and, and how it completely affected us all. And I realized as I was walking through the streets that night that I had a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, union for both in John Bell Hood. After the, uh, after the war, he moves to New Orleans. Everyone loves the story, loves the hate hood uh, of, of the breakup of his fiance, uh, uh, Buck Preston. Sally Preston was kind of the belle of Richmond. She was a teenager when she went to Richmond at the beginning of the war. And she came from an important South Carolina family. And she really becomes kind of the black widow of the Confederacy. I mean, she every boy she dates either gets killed or hopelessly wounded. Remember uh, Hood? That, year before Franklin is doing this at Gettysburg and a bullet goes through his arm and he now has this, this withered left arm and then he's down in a campaign for Atlanta, uh, Chigamaya, and he gets a bullet so high up and they have to take the ball joint and, and he has this cork leg and when he rides a horse it looks like this and he's starting to look like a Monty Python character. And if people weren't killed in battle or hopelessly wounded like Hood, her, her boyfriends ended up killing themselves. I mean, she really did, you know, everyone she seemed to touch seemed to c come to no good end. And that everyone loves the story of the breakup, who loves to hate Hood. Uh, we know about it because, uh, like every other event that happened in the Civil War, the Forrest Gump of the Confederacy, Mary Chestnut, was in the room. I mean, you know, you don't even have any privacy when you're trying to break up with someone. Mary Chestnut said, you know, let me just come in. I may write about it in my diary, but no one will ever know. But she tells in great detail about the breakup, you know. Hood begins to touch his fiance, and Buck Preston pushes him away. Because remember, he's got that cork leg, and it's like, whoop, 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 and he's on the ground. And Mary Chestnut reports that sweat came down his face, and she felt sorry for him. But, you know, uh, the people, who love to hate Hood, don't like to talk about what happened next, and that is that he moved to New Orleans and he married a, a woman far finer, uh, a woman far better than Mary Chet, than, than, 
than Butt Preston could have ever been. Now, I have to tell you a little side. Um, I was in a, uh, the Margaret Mitchell house receiving this award from them, and it was an audience of about 80 people in there. And there were, on the front right was this woman who looked to be, you know, I'm not a good judge of age, but maybe 190 years old. <laughs> and she, uh, she, it was clear that in her life she had never touched the back of a chair. And she looked like she'd just come from studio costume, and she was going to be playing the, the, grand, the Dowager Empress. She was all in black, and she had a black cane with a gold handle, and she was paved in pearls. And when I got finished speaking, I glanced over with this bony finger, she called me over. And I, uh, I came over and I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, do you know who I am? And I went, no, ma'am. And she goes, um, but Preston's great niece. And I'm like, dang, 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 why did I tell that story? Why did I tell that story? <laughs> and she said, but Preston hurt every life she ever touched, including my entire family. You can never say enough bad about Bud Preston. <laughs> you know, that is one of the great strengths of the South. We can, we can resent people we've never even met. There's no doubt that we need Jesus. Because, you know, that's what he's there for. He forgives, we don't have to. You know, we just move on in life, you know? <clears throat> I mean, you know, I'm just sitting there. But, you know, it was great. I got the Preston family seal of approval. Be sure you say something nasty about that. <clears throat> so he moves, he moves to New Orleans, and he meets this woman. And uh, she's, she's quite an extraordinary woman. She's a young girl. But her impact is uh, it's going to turn out to be very strong in the world. You know, when I was finishing the book, and you know, you finally, you're there, your editor says you're there, and everyone's happy, and all of a sudden, somebody sent me this memoir of an old uh, um, Catholic, Anglo-Catholic priest. And lo and behold, there was this whole new chapter in her life that I just left out. But I want to include it to you because it, it's one of those extraordinary things about how she was to touch important lives. You see, this boy was an Anglican and he had, he had gone to Paris. He had converted to Catholicism and he had gone and he was he's studying. He was a seminarian and he was studying to be a priest. And he, he met this girl, Anne-Marie Henning. She was a teenager living in Paris. She was educated there during the war. And he fell hopelessly head over heels in love with her. And he wanted uh, nothing more than to spend his life with her. But he had this huge conflict. And as he tells the story, this, this teenager, this kind of what, what could be this frivolous girl, pushed him not away, but toward what he believed was his true calling, that that was what it was, that she refocused him in this moment in his life when he so believed that he was at a forked road. She said, no, you're over here. And so he went on with his life. And for writers, it's important because he grew up and he became Cardinal Newman. And the whole Anglo-Catholic movement came out of that.